you matter. No matter who you are, where you are, what you've done, you matter. Every decision you make, every breath you take, everything you do, you matter. So if you want to be part of creating the world we want to see, just think about what you're doing and, and understand that that decision to buy the, you know, seventh generation unbleached toilet paper matters. And I think we need, we, you and I, Mark, yeah. and people like us need to work harder to get consumers to understand, everyone is a consumer, to understand that everything you do is important. Diane Hatz is my guest on this episode of Inside Ideas, brought to you by 1.5 Media and Innovators Magazine. Diane is a social entrepreneur working to create a more helpful, sustainable, equitable world with a strong focus on food and farming. She is currently the CEO and founder of Boma Grow USA, as well as founder and executive director, director of the nonprofit Change Food and its latest program, Plant, Eat, Share, an effort to provide resources for communities to grow and share healthy food. She has also founded and hosted TEDx Manhattan, Changing the Way We Eat from 2011 to 2015. In the show notes, I'm gonna list all her tags and social media and website, and we're going to get into it. Diane, welcome to the show. Thanks. It's so good to see you. Mark Buckley. <laughs> Ditto. So great to see you. It's been forever. It has been. So for our listeners, I'll, I'll catch them up a little bit. We know each other from back uh, 2017 at Seeds and Chips, where we were both speaking and our past crossed a little bit there. And then I had the uh, fortunate honor, the blessing to sit right next to you at the season chips dinner table uh, round of all other season chip speakers at the Eat Forum in Stockholm, Sweden. And um, we had a nice little exchange. There were some other cool people like Ron Finley and uh, uh, Danielle Gould at the table. And, and um, we're all pigging out and eating some good, good healthy food. And and uh, enjoying the, the eat form. But uh, that's how we know each other. And we're collaborating on a couple of things like BOMA, which we are kind of and maybe didn't know that our past because we're on different continents, um, which is a super movement organization and things are growing and changing and evolving there, uh, as, as well as you're gonna help me out with uh, some contributions to my book, Menu B, and now the podcast. And, I'm so excited. <laughs> Don't get too excited. Okay, I'll try, I'll, I'll try to calm it down. <laughs> Say that after we talk. <laughs> okay. That's the thing is, uh, I, I believe that we're, we, we both love good connections and love to talk, especially yeah. about what we're passionate about or what, what our life's goal is. And, and that's really why I, I also want, really wanted to, to speak to you and, and have you on is because there's so much uh, wisdom and things you can depart to us or kind of give us insights. Uh, I, I want to touch right off the bat on um, it's kind of, uh, get the negativity out of the way, so to say. How in the hell have you weathered this pandemic or are you still weathering the pandemic? And, and the reason I ask you this is, be, is not only because I genuinely want to know and, and I, I think been okay, but I, I want to hear also the hiccups, but you've been working in, in this area of food and, and uh, sustainability a little bit, regeneration, farming, things like this for a while, and also thinking with thought leaders with the TEDx Manhattan, uh, which should give a, a little bit of preparation or some resilience through this damn turmoil time that we've had, and so that's I want to ask if that's the case. If not, uh, I, I would like to get a catch up and, and I'm just think our listeners would as well. 
So, you know, like most people, when the pandemic hit, and I live in New York City, so we were one of the first places in the U.S. that really got hit and got hit hard. When it happened, everything just shut down. And, you know, I don't know if people can even remember back six months, we didn't know how contagious it was. We didn't know how it was transmitted. You know, people were... There were just ambulances. The hospitals are just up the road from me. So it's just sirens day and night. They had refrigerated trucks to put people who had passed away in. So it was scary. And like most people, I didn't freak out. I shut down and then rebooted and then got into action immediately. So what I did was I heard a story, and this can still make me cry. I heard a story of elderly people sitting in the cars outside stores crying because they were so afraid to go in because nobody knew like and they were afraid they were going to die so I just started organizing and I got a group of people together in the East Village Um, we ended up with about 200 volunteers we're still active now but what we did was we posted flyers all over the neighborhood and we would buy groceries walk dogs just talk to people we did neighbor helping neighbor Over the course of months, what I started to realize is that this happened spontaneously around the world, that people just stood up and said, how can I help my neighbor? And this is the key to everything I'm going to talk about today, because I think this is the answer to all our problems. People do care. People do want to help each other. People can solve problems in their own area. So what we just did yesterday was the first day. Um, I posted out, we started a Facebook group. We have over 1,200 people and you can only live in the East Village of New York to be in the group. Um, I posted out saying, I'd love to have a community fridge. And I assume you know what community fridges are. They started in Germany and they're they're all over the world now. So a restaurant owner up the road at this great like mac and cheese place called SMAC, he answered me and he said oh I've been thinking of the same thing so he found a refrigerator on the road cleaned it out plugged it in and yesterday we started it we don't even have it stocked like he has some of his mac and cheese in the freezer I went I went to check it later and people had already put food in it it's amazing so so I still have anxiety I still am nervous about the second wave but I feel confident that there are enough people in my community that will do whatever they can to help somebody else out that is fabulous and you're right I've heard stories and I've had people on on the show that have said the exact same thing you know um it's it's our basic resource food and you know breathing food water shelter security and uh, this connection this social connection of how do we happen? How, how do we do it? How do we make it happen that we get our basic needs and our basis uh, covered for each other and people rallying, especially for uh, in Thailand, it was really big. The hospital workers um, weren't even getting food from their own kitchen and, and serving the patients and serving them and working tons of shifts wow. and things. And so a lot of people rallied around that. And then also that the, the elderly, uh, they, they were having some huge anxieties of where they're going to get their food and right. and how, how are they going to, you know, whether they don't want to go out, they're like in a panic mode, but also how are they going to get their essentials? And, and, you know, some of them didn't have family. So there was a huge type of rally around that. So I loved, I love to hear that, but I'm also um, glad to hear that you're human and you, you, you really, you, you also, even though you have the preparedness and you're connected and you, and you have this thought about food, but that you're, it was a difficult time for you, but you found a way to kind of get out of that, uh, that mode of, you know, uh, lockdown or anxiety or fear that uh, how can we help or move forward? Uh, well, and I think, I think everyone can do what they can do. So I, yeah, I'm in my 50s, so I'm borderline in that uh, danger zone area. I wasn't out on the street delivering the food, but what I could do was organize people to deliver food. So people, you know, sort of took what they could do and then used it to help, help however they could. And that's something I think that is actually inherent in everybody that we don't always give enough credit to. And I don't think people always 
not congratulate themselves, but realize that those little acts are what changes the world. I, I totally believe that. I, I have been fortunate that I've been doing this for a while and it, it was difficult for me in some respects, but I'm also had this um, techno lust, this innovation, this foresight from the future and that so that I, I've been trying to prepare for the humans of new work and set up my environment of the way I eat and the way I work in a certain way. And so some of these transitions weren't as, as hard for me, but what I, I really found is it put me in a unique position to be able to help people with services and food and and uh, w with information on how to make the transition, how to get a little resilience and how to to uh, not bounce, bounce back, but also do this reset or use these times in, in a different way. And, you know, busier than ever on, on things during this lockdown, which is really interesting, but it's nice to hear that. What can you tell us about, um, plant, eat, and share and when it started and kind of how that's evolved and, and what you're doing with it now. Um, I, I won't even ask you more. I'll just give you this, give you that to start with. And then I want to go into some specifics. Sure. So planning share came about because I started noticing over the past year or so that in different parts of the world, communities are just coming together and they're doing different things to plant and grow food that they can give to people in need. Um, it's maybe close to a year now, but the city of Copenhagen, they decided and they made a, an announcement that they are planting fruit trees and bushes in all their public spaces. I looked at this and, and, uh, and I just thought, oh my God, this is it. This is, this is, this is, this is a way communities can feed themselves. Is it gonna solve all the problems? No. Is it going to help people in crisis? Yes. Is it potentially better than a handout from the city? Yes. I mean, it's not just about planting food. So let me step back a second. Planning share is basically planting food in public spaces for people to eat for free. Um, so Copenhagen is doing that. Atlanta, Georgia, they have a 7.1 acre food forest. And if you don't know what a food forest is, it is a forest where everything is edible from the strawberries that grow on the ground to the nut trees that are growing above and everything in between. You can wander through the forest, you can pick what you need, you can eat it. I believe, so it's plant, eat, share. So it's, it's planting food, eating. It's like putting on your oxygen masks first. You help yourself to what you need, but then you share what you have with others. It's also a way to build community. There's this group, they're called Incredible Edible. They're, they started in the North of England um, is these two women, they noticed that a lot of people were out of work and were hungry and they started gorilla planting, which is Ron Finley, it's what he does. Um, he is the gorilla gardener on the planet, but they started planting food and they became known for like, like sharing food with others. People now fly from around the world to go to this town to see what they're doing and to model it. So I thought, well, why don't I put a program together pull together all these different programs, put it into a database, and then put an experiential marketing campaign around it to inspire and motivate people to get their community together and to start planting food. And that's it in a nutshell. And I, I, it's based on the belief, and Change Food is, is founded on the belief that solutions already exist, people know how to solve their own problems, and we can't tell people what to do. What we can do is we can educate, give information, inspire, and share resources and materials. So that's sort of what Planet Share is. Does that make sense? Yeah, it's a, it's a, also a lot of food sharing as well, right? Or is yeah. that another aspect of a program that you do? No, food. The food sharing is the share part of Planet Share, but it's Perfect. also like seed saving, seed swapping, and the I I actually included community fridges. That's not actually growing the food. But I think they are crucial. And what's also really important to me that I don't hear people talk about too much is loneliness and isolation. It's an epidemic. By doing these types of programs, communities come together. So people, people are able to connect within their local area and to feel that they belong to something. And I think more attention needs to be paid 
of the pandemic of loneliness that plagues the planet. It's, uh, it's horrific. It's gotten really bad how you can be in a city, a mega city with millions of people, you know, and, and still be extremely lonely. Yeah. Um, that's really, really sad. And I'm glad that you're addressing that because there are people who, who um, change and grow and thrive and actually come out of, of this uh, thing that can be very uh, detrimental to our health and mental stability uh, if we don't have that social interaction and the, that help to kind of Stimulate or change the loneliness factor. So I love I love that you address that. Um, what's the name? You also have a talk show as well, a, a video talk show. Uh, and tell us a little bit more, or tell us about that because you haven't mentioned it yet. So it's called Change Food Eats. It's the first and third Tuesday of every month. I'm sure Mark, you're every week. I couldn't handle the schedule because it's so much work. People think it's so easy to do these. It's so much work. Um, I am just inviting people on in the food movement and we're having lunch. Sometimes we actually put the food in our mouth, but the whole, it's all based around being laid back, having conversation and just, this is gonna, this is gonna contradict itself. I'm not a believer in just talk anymore but I do believe that talk can inspire action. So I'm learning through the people I'm speaking with about other ways I can take action with what I'm doing. And hopefully we can inspire the audience to hear things and to take action. I also, and I mentioned this to Mark before we started, this is, this is a very large goal, but I would like to be the Graham Norton of food. I think that the food movement can be very serious. I think that we need to have a little more levity and, and not, minimize the seriousness of the issues but to realize that we're all in this together and if we can't laugh at it how can we live yeah i agree and and i i'm i think you're going to be the diane of uh <laughs> gravity and and food and you don't need to be the graham norton but i understand where you're going there you it is always a joy to, to speak to you and just the spirit and the feeling that you get. I see a beautiful book on the shelf behind you, Waste. Is that Chris Graham Stewart's book, Waste? Yes. Yes, yes. I, I had him on the show. Uh, he actually showed up in his pajamas on the show and <laughs> talk about brevity or light. He just came as he was. And uh, I said, uh, do you, you want to put on some clothes? No, that's fine. That's okay. And his hair wasn't even done and but it was one of the most fabulous podcasts deep dive uh wonderful exchange uh about his his book first book bloodless revolution which is like the double of a, a bible read and uh and then about waste and about uh, some things that he's been doing with toast on that so that's beautiful to see your wonderful food bookshelf behind you and and um you have, yeah, there's probably a mix of other things behind there, but you have a um, somehow amassed this knowledge or this breadth around food. Did, did it come from somewhere? Did you study this? Has it just been over time? Is it because you're an eater? How did you get to this point in time? So this might sound a little roundabout, but there's a point. So I got my master's degree in creative writing. Um, I had been living in London, came back to the States. I'm like, oh, what am I gonna do? I'm like, oh, I've always loved music. I'll work in the music industry while I write fiction. So packed a U-Haul, moved to New York, got like dream job at a record company within a week of being here, which people said was impossible. Nothing is impossible, just try. Um, did it for like a year and I was like, eh. well, no, I did it for 10 years, actually. I was in the music industry. Anyway, I was working at a corporate label and the CFO called me and he said, we're never going to promote you here. And I was like, wow. So I'm like, I got to go. So I just answered a blind ad in the newspaper, ended up at a nonprofit that had just started. And I was an advocate, or you could say activist, um, helping shut down factory farms. So that was in 1998. I knew nothing. I didn't know what a nonprofit was. 
I knew nothing about environment. I mean, I, you know, I cleaned houses to pay, help pay for books for college. Like I do not, interning, what is interning? Like I have to get paid. You know, I, I just didn't have that background. So I, once I got into the nonprofit world and I got into doing what I did and I did it for a couple of years and anybody who knows anything about factory farms, there are people, they are saints and angels around the world who are trying to help hold factory farmers account accountable and shut them down. It is thankless. It is depressing. You deal with, with, with people who have brain damage from the hydrogen sulfide and, and just these, the manure, the pollution. Anyway, after a couple of years, I said to the funder, you know, this is very depressing. I don't think we're ever going to be able to reach your average consumer. So can I do a shift and work on solutions? And I had founded this program called Sustainable Table, which in its day was very successful. This is back in like 2003. I did this animation called The Matrix, um, which in its day won tons of awards. It was, it, it was considered the most successful online advocacy film ever. Not bragging, just that this is, this is back. It took six months to find someone who could take a flash animation and put it on a DVD. Like that's how old, no social media had been invented yet. Like this is, this is so I, I am a student of the streets. I mean, I learned what I learned. What I've seen is back then, consumers didn't know enough to care. So I and others like me, and back then there were only like 50 or 100 of us. So we sort of, we knew each other. We worked on getting organic to be a household name, to getting organic in grocery stores, to getting consumers to care about their food. One thing I like to explain to younger people is they didn't come out of their mother's womb wanting healthy food. It was the work of not just me, the people, people who came way before me who were really promoting what we now call regenerative food. So this is a very long answer, but I get very excited I want, about it. I want it. I want the long answer. <laughs> so as I, as I did Sustainable Table, then this is when I met Danielle Gould. I met Danielle Gould just as she started Food Tech Connect. I started seeing that Silicon Valley was starting to invest in foods and food startups started to become a big thing. I thought, oh, this would be great if we could educate the entrepreneurs and the founders of these food startups to know what healthy, sustainable, organic food is. Then as they grow into these big conglomerates, they'll do everything the right way. Well, that didn't work. So, you know, they just, when you get into VC, so I am a and I don't have it in my bio, I guess. I'm a mentor to a food accelerator also because I was very interested in getting into that aspect of the food space. Um, I think right now, the food tech space, and I'm talking all the like Sir Kensington's, I know Scott Norton, he's absolutely amazing. You know, the companies that have come out, I met um, Matt Clifford who has Barnana and then I met Ted Active, amazing. These people are amazing. And they, and, most of their hearts are in the right way. I have been to conferences where the investors want to make money. They don't give a crap about the environment. They don't give a crap about, and that's where you can get me on a soapbox and you can get me. So I still think a challenge is how do we get the whole food tech, food startup, do not get me on 3D printed ravioli or CRISPR. I don't even want to get into GMO because I will rant on forever. Why do we need to change something that is already perfect. The planet, the earth, the systems know how to grow food. They know how to grow themselves. A forest knows what to do in a forest. We don't need to come in and spray chemicals on it. Like, it, it, uh, So I think there is a lot of work that needs to be done to bring the separate sides of the movement. Like there is the food tech movement, there's the food food movement, and then there are the foodies. And we're not all in line with each other. Um, and I think that's one of the big challenges. And, and coupled with that is with climate change coming with growing hunger and instability, we don't have time just to talk anymore. What do you uh, think about all that, Mark? I am full alignment, but it's, it's really what you've unpacked is that it's a um, multifaceted complex system. And that yes, there's foodie chefs food innovations, agriculture, animal farming, there's 
uh, logistics for food. There's uh, how we process, how we produce, how we preserve, how we transport, how we grow, what the emissions. I mean, it's on and on uh, the food waste aspect. Uh, um, all those things are so um, complex. And, and that really, it's really a great transition into my first uh, question for you. Um, kind of on the journey of our uh, of our discussion today is so you you mentioned these whether food tribes or food groups that are just also not always in full alignment with each other or not on the same page or don't see the big vision that you're trying to bring together get to work together trying to figure out uh, a future of food um, I believe it ties to even bigger picture and that is are you a global citizen and how would you feel about a world without nations, borders, divisions of humanity, um, whether whether it's you or in general? Because, uh, and I'll and I'll explain why I'm asking you that question. When, once you've answered it. Okay. So wait, you're asking me if I'm a global citizen. So Do you I consider am... or feel yourself like a global citizen, and how would you feel about a world? without nations, divisions, borders, and especially those separations of humanity from one another and especially nature? Yes, I consider myself a global citizen. I was gonna say, I separate the world into assholes and not assholes, but I don't, <laughs> but I would rather say into people who understand and people who haven't understood don't understand yet. Um, I think borders are irrelevant. I think bureaucracy, you know, borders just create, create bureaucracies. I think that it's arrogant of me to assume that I know what's going on in the global South. So even though I am a global citizen and I support things happening around the world, I believe in local. So act locally, but exist globally. Um, I am of the belief that we need people who can bring together what people are doing successfully, especially with climate change. I think a lot of people don't understand how much is going to change because the climate is changing. That's, you know, what kind of food is produced, um, where people are going to live, water is going to become more scarce. And it already is. This is already happening. We're going to have migration. So they're countries that think, oh, we have no problem. We have all this water. Well, you're going to have 20 million people that are going to want to come into your country because they can't live in theirs anymore. And I think that we need to look at that globally. We also need, I think most people get extremely overwhelmed if you look at the whole planet. So we have to break it down. Um, what I think is really crucial is that people understand that they do make a difference and each choice they make, the butterfly effect, each choice they make can affect the entire planet. And that is something I don't think people have in their DNA. So, so that's probably what I am passionate about, sort of getting people to understand that, that every purchase you make, every even thought you think, every positive every thank you every i believe so i don't i don't know the chemicals um so i'm not a scientist but you know people get addicted to, to horror and violence and they want more and more and more the, the, but if you uh, if it bleeds it leads the amygdala of our brain right. but if you also if you do an act of kindness that is also contagious i mean i took a cab home once and there was ten dollars on the floor and I gave it to the cab driver. He's like, no, 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 it's yours. I'm like, dude, it's your cab. Keep the money. Got to my destination. Get out. Give him the, he's like, no, 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 this is on me. So I gave him $10, but he gave me over $20 in a free cab ride. That to me is a microcosm of what life is, is that you do kindness. There is, but I think that's oxytocin or, you know, I don't know what yeah, brain yeah. chemicals, but that also feeds on itself. So we need to get people addicted to the oxytocin not the amygdala adrenaline negative stuff and i think that's how we create it and you do that by buying your elderly neighbor a quart of milk 
or knocking on their door to see if they're okay. That's how we change. That's how I believe we change the world. I agree. I agree. I'm, I'm in line. And I, um, I have a lot of scientists or authors or people who are, quote, these specialists or experts in their areas on the show. And sometimes when I ask them that question, well, I'm not qualified to answer that. Sorry. And, you know, or, you know, and um, you just basically <clears throat> opened your heart. You told me how you think, how you feel, how you see it. And, and, and that, yes, you are. But you don't know how people in the deep south or in south uh, right. um, are, and so I, I appreciate that honesty and that view. The the reason it's kind of leading. I'm leading you on this journey, and I want to unpack and explain a little bit to it. During the pandemic, um, our air, our water, was a global citizen. The species and the animals that cross borders and and, and mm -hmm. nations, they are global citizens. Um, uh, the pandemic is a global citizen. Um, food is a global citizen. Um, if we look at the the United Kingdom, uh, or yeah, the United Kingdom, and look at the footprint around the world of where they get their food sources for the United Kingdom that, that travel to the United Kingdom to then be consumed in the United Kingdom, that that footprint is quadruple the size of the United Kingdom around other parts of the world, uh, you know, whether it's bananas from South America or foods from Russia or uh, potatoes from Russia or foods from, you know, different parts of the world, uh, that food is a global citizen going to feed people who really, in some respects, are in lockdown. They're not being treated like global citizens. Um, um, and what we've seen during this this pandemic is that there, and even before in some of our nationalistic political views, and I don't want to get political either, is that some decisions are being made around the world by the Trumpocalypses, the Bolsonaros, the Putin Shays, and whoever else it is that affect us globally, that affect the airs we breathe and the waters we drink um, globally. And um, so I, I find it really hard for us not to think that uh, we're, we're a global citizen or that we should move to that direction as not only politically, but as humanity, that we're all crew members of Spaceship Earth. We can all take a hand and put our hand on the steering wheel and guide our future in a local way. We can do it very locally, which has a big, huge ripple effect globally. I mean, there's no way you can tell me that um, the Amazon uh, forest burning in Brazil don't affect us all over the world. Uh, the, the fires in Australia, the things that are going on in Brexit affect all of us all around the world. Maybe not immediately, but eventually. And if you absolutely don't feel like a global citizen, then please do not any, eat any foods that are not produced locally, that are not made locally because if they're transported from South America, if they're transported from China or wherever, then um, don't take part in those global goods um, because that is truly a global system is the ability to move goods uh, around the globe, but it's also the ability that we get that in the same way. And that's some of my opinions and I don't wanna force them on you at all, but I would like to not only have our listeners and kind of maybe see if you have any other thoughts or feelings on this. I, I like this term local, you know, this, and you, you mentioned it as well, this vision globally that we understand on the big planet that we're on, think globally, but act very locally. And, and uh, through that process, not only are we taking care of ourselves, but we're also uh, protecting human health and the environment in, in that process of thinking and acting that way. Uh, and that's also where we want to go eventually. We want to get back to a system of, of uh, farm to fork type of a system where it's really local and regional. Uh, most of our, our cities, and you heard, you've heard me say this before, the agrarian society is over 12,000 years old. It's the oldest and most longest running successful economy in our world. And um, it was the built up of cities and cultures and nations and, and beautiful things. And now today, 
Uh, sorry to say, uh, Diane, cities are a place that food goes to die. And that is such a sad thing. My God, uh, if you know anything about agriculture and how it works, those nutrients, those vitamins and minerals that come from the soil, they get put into our food and then they, they get delivered to the cities or they get consumed. And, and back in the day, our poop, our, our those, those rest nutrients by composting used to go back to the soils of the farm. Today, that cycle's been broken. Those, 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 the food goes to cities to die. Instead of keeping that circular system, that global system of getting back to where it needs to be. And so that's why I really like, how do we get this local, get the food to go back to the cities, the nutrients to go back to the farms, the, that we keep this, this, this system moving. And I think more of a, this global or crew member view is, is, is a nicer way. And I, I hope, hopefully haven't gotten off tangent, but that's kind of why I was leading you in that question. And I appreciate your honest response because you cannot believe some of the responses I've had over, over the, the years when I asked that question. I would, 10 years ago, I might have agreed with you about food comes to cities to die. I don't anymore. I'm an ad, uh, active and advocate for composting. Like I, I compost. Yeah. I go to my farmer's market. I see the bins of food. People are dropping off once a week. One of the unfortunate effects of the pandemic is most of the composting has stopped, but this, um, very large com apartment complex had like 20 composting bins outside and you weren't supposed to put your stuff in, but I would during the week. I think that there's a bigger problem because I think it's 40% less nutritious. Food is now about 40% less nutritious than it was in like the 1940s and 1950s. So you have to eat four or six apples to get the nutrition of one apple. So that's not about coming to a city. So I hear what you're saying, but I think that people need to understand the industrial revolution is dead. The industrial revolution is over. We are in a regenerative or restorative revolution. And if you don't know that yet, you're gonna soon, or we're gonna die, basically. Um, what I think is really important, forget the politicians, forget the multinational. I, honestly, my take is, they're not going to change until they're forced, forced to change. The only way they're going to be forced to change is that each person make decisions locally in their house, in their kitchen, that advocates for the future they want to see. And that's where I think it'll change. People say, oh, you know, Unilever, they're changing their ways and this and that. And you know what they are? They are but they're so big and so slow, we can't sit around and wait for them. So I try not to buy their, pro their products. I look for who's making stuff locally and go out of my way. I shop at a local bakery. I look for the independent stores. And that's, I know that's me. Some people are like, oh, well, Walmart's so easy. Hey, look, you gotta go there, you gotta go there. But then once a week, find a local baker. Not only will you be helping your local economy, you're going to understand how much better the food tastes. You're going to understand what real food is again. Like I had, I was doing an event and they had uh, like Debbie's donuts or Enemans donuts, something like that, like a packaged store product. And I don't shop in those kinds of stores, so I don't even know, but I bit into one and I literally spit it out. I'm like, this is not food. This is not food. So we not only need to get people to understand that this is where like I come in and where I'm really passionate about, we have to make it equal. I am very fortunate that I can shop at my local organic health food store. Not many people can. So what can I do to help other people? This is where I think Plan Eat Share is really important. I think that through that, planning of food in local areas, people can gain skills in marketing a product. Like leftover food from these gardens can go to making pasta sauce. So people can start their own businesses, young people, and they can get skills and then they can get a better wage. Then we have to get into living wages and it gets bigger and bigger. So don't get overwhelmed, just choose something your neighbor. 
I had a neighbor, she doesn't live here anymore. She had a cookie company. So, and they, they would sell them in the deli downstairs because she got them. So I would go downstairs to the deli and I would make sure I bought her cookies. That was my radical act of kindness, let's say for the day. And we can all do that. I don't care where you live. I don't care. I don't care. We can all do something like that. Absolutely, we can. Yeah, I, I love your your positive spin on that, and I, I I I agree. There are some cities. Paris is really good. New York is good. Or not everywhere in New York, but some villages and districts are really good about composting and putting that out. Um, and we're getting better. That shift is is moving and. Um, because I want to shift your thinking, Mark. I think a lot of food is to, dead yeah. before it gets to the city. Well, absolutely. And we need to, you know, we need to go back to that. Um, I also think, you know, people tend to judge people in lower income areas who don't have access to healthy food. Oh, they're just eating fast food. No, they're eating and they have no choice. So yeah. people want to eat healthy. How can we find ways to make that happen? A friend of mine, Steve Ritz, Green Bronx Machine, you should totally interview him. He's amazing. Um, he, in schools, grows food and, and he has a farm and it's free. They hand, they've handed out, his wife alone this season handed out 100,000 pounds of food. Yep. They're he, in the he, Bronx. He wears the cheese hat, right? Yes, he's yeah, cheese hat yeah. man. He's yeah. the cheese hat man. Yeah, I I. I Matter of fact, I posted, um, he just has got a nice little movie or trailer coming out. Yes, so I just his film. Well, yes, his film. the trailer's yeah. out. Yeah, the film's coming out. Ooh, it's coming I out think soon, isn't soon. it? Soon. Yeah. Yeah, he's having a premiere. Yeah. Totally I, worth checking out. The I just barely posted that. He, he's a great man. He was, matter of fact, uh, the uh, I think it was 2018, uh, he was on a panel that I did at Seeds and Chips, a panel, a, a group panel of talks that I did there as well. And he spoke as well. And he, he's doing amazing things, not only uh, 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 people after my own heart, uh, kids, and that's where we really need to get it and connect kids back to food and understanding he's doing fabulous work. That So, the, that, so I, well, yeah, go ahead. Go ahead. No, that, I want to. I want to take that this. triggers. Take this. Uh, that triggers another thought because you just got done in, um, interviewing a fabulous uh, as a director or producer for Gather a movie yeah. on, on your show, Sanjay. And uh, uh, I want one. I have to say, I've got a little bit of I don't know envy or lust. I love Jason Momoa. My God, he's got the best beard and the best hair. I, you know, I always say I'm a cross between Jesus and Farrah Fer Fawcett, but my goodness, that man's got some hair. And, and uh, I, I, no, I just like him. I think he's a nice guy. Uh, uh, um, but he's, a, I think he's doing something with the indigenous tribes at, the, um, at one of the uh, protests where they're on the road, blocking the road in that movie, Gather, I think. But I mm -hmm. love that interview and that triggered that you know i don't know if you want to say something about that but you have fabulous people that are doing amazing things and raising awareness on your show um that that i would like all my listeners to go support uh plant eat share and join your community and 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 bring it to the local also what you're doing with boma eats and and because there's a plethora of of wisdom and people who are just grassroots bottom up who are doing amazing things that that need to be done they're so uh, need to be seen and applied into action because um it's not just a one size fits all it's not just a uh, uh, one thing that you can do there's so many things we could do and there's so many tools out there we just have to know what they are and where to find them and and apply the ones that fit best to us and and, and then Right. Once, once we've got a solid foundation, we're doing good, then we can ripple out to our community and cities and, and, and grow and move it. And so I, that, that's just when, when we mentioned that uh, Mr. Cheese Hat Man, and that really triggered me of what the fabulous work you're doing. Oh, you're so kind. Okay, a couple things, because you're getting me on a soapbox and I am okay. getting ready to roll. I love it. Okay, <laughs> okay so Cheese Hat Man, that's Steve Ritz. Now, the thing about Steve, and this is what I have seen, and listen, I'm in the same, I don't want to say I'm in the same situation, but I'm in a very similar situation. People like him work their ass off 24-7, and they don't get funding. 
people with big, well-funded nonprofits can come and get their picture with him, and then they use that to get funding for themselves. So the nonprofit industrial complex, funding complex, needs to be dismantled or overridden. Philanthropists have to start to understand that they have a stake in this game too. And just saying, oh, I'm going to give $10 million to hunger, that's not necessarily solving the problem because it's usually going to one, maybe two nonprofits. And I believe that when any company gets to a certain size, it spins wheels and it just exists to exist. So solving the problem doesn't become the goal. The goal comes to become, becomes just to exist to exist. So I think that we need nimbler organizations, nimbler co companies. I, I personally believe, I don't know about other countries, but here in the US, everyone should become a corporation, become an, like an independent contractor, start your own business, get incorporated, it helps tax wise, and then hire contractors, hire like-minded people who have their own companies when you need them. I think that saves resources and that helps you stay nimble. It's, it's the, oh, I just filled out a funding letter of inquiry. It took a week and a half, at least eight hours a day to answer these questions. And this is just a letter of inquiry. They said, you'll hear back in two days. It's been over two weeks. I haven't even heard a no. That is so infuriating. I'd rather go work for the man. You know what I mean? Like I have these days. Yeah, yeah. Um, so the second thing with Jason Momoa, did you see the Trevor Noah interview with him recently about the film. That I was did. amazing. It was amazing. So Sanjay Rao is the director. He was the person that I interviewed on my show. I knew him first um, from TEDx Manhattan and his film Food Chains, which was about tomato pickers um, and, and everything that they go through. Uh, tomatoes from Florida, folks, uh, look into it. But this film is about Native Americans reclaiming the food culture. Um, Trevor Noah brought this up and I was the same way. I didn't realize that the US government used food and taking away buffalo, which was a, the major food source for a lot of Native Americans as a way to uh, decimate the population. So there are Native Americans around the country that are starting to reclaim the food culture, foraging. And I am so inspired. This film is so great. I think Anybody who has any interest in an indigenous culture, especially people in the U.S., should definitely watch this film. It's amazing. And Sanjay, um, he got unheard of access. He's in, of Indian descent, of the country India. And the, the Native Americans he spoke with welcomed him in because I think his father came from India. He understands the immigrant experience. So it's a really well done, amazing film. I can't speak enough about it. Yeah, now, yeah. Third I'll, thing. I'll post that in the show notes as well. Okay, so third thing, what to do. Everyone can do something. You and I, we're at a certain level. Honestly, just like compost, research it. Just look at what is composting? How can I compost? I would suggest if you start, leave the food in your freezer if you're only taking it somewhere once a week because it can really stink. Um, but people get like, and I'm not putting worms under my kitchen sink. Some people really get excited about the verma composting thing everybody can do something just buy local and i know that's that's become a, a catchphrase and it's overused but but it's exciting to find an entrepreneur living on your street or in your neighborhood who has started a company like like i would think anybody would want to support that the other thing i want to mention is don't you might feel differently don't worry about the the big the big like overhanging fruit. You want, the, you, want, you want to do things on the bottom. Like I am not top down. I'm actually anti top down. The only way the top changes, and I'm talking government, I'm talking multinationals, large corporations. The only way they change is when they're forced to change. And the way they're forced to change is by consumers and voters. So people, I think the most important thing, and I think, I hope there are people working on this is getting people to understand that you matter. Every breath you take matters. And I'm not joking. I know you're not, even though that's, <laughs> you're, you're not fulfilling your, your comedian uh, 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 
pledge to me on the show so far. You're being too serious. Oh, 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 okay. Well, that's kidding. my show. <laughs> <laughs> that's your show. No, that's great. So you, there, there's, um, and I, I if, if I'm not supposed to bring this up, to, just tell me to shut up and I'll move on to the next question. But uh, you have a love for animals and th there's this uh, dog sitting that you do with Beaker once in a while, but did that, has that always been that way or did it come from your uh, time uh, against these animal agriculture, these factory farms, your love for animals or was it all always there before? And then how, how has that evolved or developed and, and does that play a big role in what you do or uh, as well? Wow. I never really thought about it. it. It, I don't think it came from the factory farm work. It came about, I had adopted a dog and I knew nothing about dogs. Um, so I didn't even think to do research. I just assumed all dogs were good dogs and dogs can adapt. Anyway, eight months later, the dog couldn't live in New York City. Um, I, he just lunged after everything, hated men. Like he would just growl and try to like, Rawr! he he did that to two, two, like two, three-year-old twins that were walking down the street. And so I had to give him up and I can still cry because I love that dog so much. So to get through it, I started fostering. So Beaker is just one of my fosters. I foster animals um, when I can, and some people can have a dog. I think that a lot of people shouldn't have dogs in a city because you can't yeah. give them time. I traveled a lot, so I could take a dog for a month two weeks, six weeks. After six weeks, like I just would be, I'm too mobile. I, I mean, just to be completely transparent, you know, I was dealing with loneliness and isolation and you want to do, you want to think of a way, get a cat or a dog, dogs, especially. I'm not, I love cats. I'm not a cat person. I'm sorry to all you cat people out there, but if you want to understand unconditional love, get a dog. Okay, so no I think I get more out of it than the dogs do most times. Um, and there is nothing to me, there is nothing more moving and satisfying than taking in a dog that is so traumatized. And it takes about four or five days. And then like one day they'll just perk up and you'll see like a light in their eyes. And then like by two weeks, they, they're just a different being. Like they come from just like broken souls back into these just loving, just beautiful. Even the ones that snap Beaker, like his owners. So I, I offer free dog sitting to any of the fosters I had. So every now and then I'll get a foster back. Um, the, the, the adopters and I think that he was horrifically abused at night. So at night he get very snappy. So even though he snaps at you, you just have to love this dog. Like he's, he's so anyway. So not connected, but I think that we each, I, I, again, I'm going to go back to isolation and disconnection. I think that's, I think I had heard that the militia groups in Michigan, et cetera, that one of the reasons they're forming is that people feel disconnected and isolated. So I think there needs to be serious effort put into how to bring people together to me. I, I would actually, before the pandemic, a couple of times a month, I would take puppies into offices around Manhattan. So these like advertising accounting law firms, and we go into a conference room with like four or five puppies. And then people would come in and just get to play with the puppies. And it socializes the dogs, but to watch people stiff in their suit and whatever, come in and be around a puppy, you can just see, you can just see their muscles relaxing. Yeah, it's fabulous. So, uh, there, I've seen in Hamburg and in, in Germany, especially, tons of uh, not just startups, but tons of companies. And when they list their team or their employees, they always have like a cat or a dog somehow on, on the on the website as well. When you go into the offices, you see that much more, and, and there is a, a lot of things to that. I mean, it's not uh, uh, you can't do it everywhere, and. Um, I'm surprised we even see it in Germany because sometimes they're so rigid and stiff on their quality and how they do that, that you can tell those are some pretty progressive work environments. And 
believe it or not, there's been some books. One of them is Tim Laborek's book, um, The Business Romantic. It was done in English and, and, and German and a couple other languages, I think 12 other languages. But he's a big TED, TED speaker as well, a couple million views. But he speaks on this, you know, um, a different way of doing business. And then there's Frederick Laloux, who's also, uh, I think he's Belgian, uh, but he lives he speaks German as well. He wrote the book, Reinventing Organizations and Things, that this uh, the future of work, the future of life and how we do business. And I believe these small, medium enterprises, the startups, the innovators, the social entrepreneurs, um, you're, you're speaking about, you know, start a business, get started not only for the, the tax and other benefits, but the benefits of how that can, you can make an impact, a change, a difference, um, that while these big uh, flunky organizations who were sometimes frustrated with, these small, medium organiz uh, enterprises, organizations we can see come in and actually while they're trying to make the curve, will eat those organizations lunch and disrupt industries. Um, right with some innovations and some different ways of thinking, you know, the regenerative ag movement and Rodale Institute and other things um, is coming from nowhere, but is a huge power horse now that is very agile and quick and, and, and making a lot of organizations and ways of doing things, take up, uh, stand up and take notice and really say, hey, we've got to listen. If they don't get on board with the change uh, or, or do that, they're going to be gone. They're not, they're not going to be something that we need to worry about in the future. Um, leads me to my biggest question, scariest question for you. Be fearful. Uh, no, I'm just teasing. It's the burning question, WTF. And in this decade of action, 2020, a lot of us are like oh, WTF. Yeah, I've said that a hundred times this year because of the pandemic. It's not the swear word, it's what's the future? Diane, I wanna know what's what's the future, at least for you in, in, in your community, what's the future? That's a very big question. Um, I believe the future is what we make of it. I wanted to be an astrophysicist. I was told girls can't do math. I saw an interview with the woman that just won the um, Nobel Prize in chemistry. And she said, I was told women can't do math. And I said, screw that, I'm doing math. I went the other way and I didn't have that career, but I've always been very interested in physics and spirituality. I'm saying this because um, everything is energy. That table is not solid. It's energy. So our perceptions, the energy we put, we put out is creates our future. I think, I think the future is both written and unwritten. See, I, I mean, I can get very philosophical on this. So the future for me is one in which my life and every day is filled with gratitude. And through that gratitude is abundance. And through that abundance is joy. And that's the universe I choose to live in. And I think each of us has that choice to create our own future. Thank you. I, I, I don't want to even add to it. So that's, that's exactly, that was the right answer. Just ding, 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 <laughs> you, you, you've won the prize. That was the right answer. No, uh, thank you for that. So a lot of uh, a lot of times people, <clears throat> one, uh, it's the first time they've ever asked themselves that question, what's the future? And, uh, and pretty much every time it's a different answer. Um, part of the reason I ask is I genuinely want to know from you what the future is, but I also want to know how, um, how well you know yourself and how well you've thought about that question in the future so that uh, uh, and I can see in your life and what I know behind the scenes, which I won't reveal to any of my listeners that I know that you've got a nice plan 
for the future of where you're going. And I'm excited to, to be partnered with you on a, a few things and to be able to observe it and to know you. Um, I, I uh, really now want to go into a, a couple other things. So uh, how, how well are you versed in um, this, uh, this, this energy, this, um, the, the basic elements of life that we're all part of a symbiotic earth or um, that we're all built up of microbes and uh, microorganisms and, and mi microorganisms, micro uh, 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 cells, microorgan cells and um, that uh, there's a strong tie to our biome and the symbiotic earth um, and our, the biome of our body and our gut and our, how we're built up as human beings. Well, I just had my second, my second uh, micro gut microbiome analysis done. So I, I wouldn't say I'm well versed in it, but I'm gaining experience. And what I didn't, things I didn't know, the first time I had it done, I had a, a apple pit virus. Who knew that viruses that, uh, that fruits and vegetables get on trees can get into your gut. I think that, um, again, everything is interconnected. So what I put in my body affects the universe. I mean, we can get into the whole, we really are all from stardust. Like we are all connected. I'm cheering I mean, in the background true. for it's all the physics. audio lizards. Yes. Carl Sagan's, we are all star stuff. <laughs> we are, we are. Live long and prosper. Um, probably why I'm a huge sci-fi fan. Yes. <laughs> um, but I think that people, I think a lot of people have lost their connection with themselves and they busy themselves with material and outward. Um, and I don't want to say that's wrong. I think that's a, that's just a byproduct of many people's society in which they grew. I think that if one wants to find happiness or peace, one has to look inward and that does even include knowing what, what bacteria are swimming around in your gut. Like right now I have a cucumber virus, so I can't eat cucumber, oh you know, and I'll get goodness. tested again. And, and the whole microbiome thing with the personal health is also very new. Like it's, it's uh, I don't wanna say it's hit or miss, but it, I do think it's a way to go. I think it's a way to cure depression. And I think the other thing I'm really into, we're gonna go into health stuff now, intermittent fasting. Yep. Intermittent fasting is like, and I don't want to get get onto because fads, you know, it's not a yes. fad. Yeah. So many medical things I've had have my A one C improved. I just got back from the doctor. My thyroid, my medication has been drastically reduced, and it's all from intermittent fasting. And I'm not. I need to change some of what I'm eating. I'm not changing what I'm eating. Like it's my birthday on Sunday, and I got a gluten free cake I ordered for myself, and I am just eating that thing. So I think that. We are all connected to the earth, to each other, to the stars. I think that through that, it would, I, I, through that I hope that more people can help people understand that they are not alone and they are connected to everyone and everything. And that I've spent a lot of time learning that if someone is mean or someone is rude or if someone does something um, negative, violent, angry, that person is hurting and that they're not really trying to hurt me. They're just expressing their pain because they don't know what to do. Um, I think food affects people's moods. So again, it's all interconnected. It really Mark, is. we're going to solve all the world's problems, aren't we? Of course we, we are. <laughs> that's, half what, an hour more. that's what this podcast is about, the deep dive. We want to solve the global grand challenges and get into the depth and substance. I mean, I... I, I, I so if you, you want to know... You make no, me smile. You make me smile so much when you give those answers because... So our, our, our microbiome, our gut health, our, our, um, the, the microbes in our stomach that help us digest food and, and that we really need for health, 
our own personal biome, they're calling it the second brain. It really drives us it and is. affects us not only emotionally as loneliness, depression, health problems, but it also is a second brain that um, is making a lot of decisions, believe it or not, on, on how we act and how we treat other people, how we, uh, how we interact with this world. But it's also very closely tied to the biome of our planet. So yes. good soil health, uh, a healthy biome in our soils and our planetary biome has in, in many respects um, been degrading. In 2015, the United Nations FAO said we have 60 harvests left and uh, for, on traditional agriculture. Well, I, I just give you the update. It's 45 harvests now. We've actually had some other uh, contaminations and problems and uh, or, or now that have actually accelerated that we have 45 harvests left. And, and boy, that's, it's scary because it's closely tied to the biome of our gut and how we can maintain and nurture and, and keep that, that health for humanity. And that's a big, issue there and um so to go back to a little bit that this overview effect or this cosmic perspective carl sagan said we are all star stuff that we're made from the interior of collapsing stars the 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 calcium and and, and our um apple pies and and uh the, you know all, he went down and broke it all down that it's the same thing that's from star stuff is the same thing in our earth is the same thing in the basic elements of human body. And what was really crazy is I had a Sasha Sagan, um, um, Carl Sagan's daughter on my podcast and talked to her about it. But Carl Sagan's first wife, Lynn Margulis, is the scientist that disrupted the entire system of uh, microbiology and uh, microorganisms and she discovered mycorrhiza and the different bacteria um, the the basics of human life and came up with this term the symbiotic earth uh, and mm -hmm. symbiosis basically and it's so interesting you know he he gave us this term you know we are all star stuff we're you know, stars and, and how we're tied to earth. And then she gave us this about the symbiotic earth, mycorrhiza, microorganisms. And now the last few years, it wasn't until 2015 as well, that we discovered this whole new branch on the tree of life, these microorganisms and bacteria that before we didn't know existed, but they all within our own body, they're in our gut health. And, you know, you've said it's not really a trend or a fad, it's just this human collective intelligence with knowledge of we're starting to figure out, you know, right. how we work right. and what things are going. So I love hearing the fact that you, that you, you've had it done twice and that you realize the importance and, you know, uh, simple things that we're doing that, you know, there's no label on an apple that says you're going to get this uh, uh, issue with your gut, you know, because the, the, the interior seeds of an apple core or a cucumber that uh, is dealing with your biome, you know, but that comes from the food that we eat, which is your initial point, which you've mentioned many times, the most basic cellular breakdown level of our energy of our planet is a caloric intake. It's calorie, it's food, it's what we eat to drive our body temperature, keep it regulated and keep our body motor running, you know, and- um, Okay. You brought up a trigger word. Okay. Calorie. Do 100 calories of M&Ms equal 100 calories of broccoli? I think the whole concept of calories is outdated. It is, but I but I the, think the term caloric intake, I'm just saying, is, is a measurement of, of energy. And it's okay. our humanity's basic energy. I, I'm also not calorie counting and all that. That's It's a bunch of hooey, uh, but... The, the, if we break it down, the, it's our energy source. It's like, it's like you would never buy a cell phone and not know where you're going to charge the battery or change the battery. You'd never buy right. a car and not know we're going to get right. gas. You'd never, you know, you, you've got to keep that thing going. Well, we, we didn't purchase this body, but we were born with it. And by damn, we've forgotten out 
guarantee where we're going to get the best food, the best fuel for our engine to keep our body running long and healthy with longevity. We've given that stewardship over to 10 big corporations and to, you know, done a lot of horrible things. And I don't want to get into that. But once humanity starts to make those connections, which you've all touched upon during this point, is so vital. And so I would just, I'd love for you to get on your soapbox again, or maybe dissect anything that I've just touched upon, if that's touched a nerve, or if you find that interesting as well, or maybe we can depart some wisdoms to, to our listeners. Well, one thing I would like people to understand is when we talk about soil health, you know, and it does help improve um, the nutrition in the food, but in studies that they've done, people who live the longest, the one thing they have in common is they garden. The microbes in healthy soil, when you put your hands in the soil and you walk across the soil, absorbs into your body, that actually cures depression. That actually like can help heal you and it, it is its own form of nutrition. So take off your shoes and walk. And I know that might sound simple, but I also think that simple solutions build to big solutions. Um, I think that people, I get, I, I don't want to speak for anyone else. I get overwhelmed. You know, I do this all day long. I just know a lot by osmosis because I've been around this world for so long. I still some days just want to shut down and eat cake. Um, I think that people need to realize this is fun. There are a lot of people doing it. Um, and that you're, it, it, it's your health. So to, to take it personally, it's your neighbor's health and it's your planet's health. If you are having children or have children or have grandchildren and you want them to have a world, like just have a world, not a world better or like yours, just a world then you need to start sitting up and taking note of this. Now, I fault us for this, Mark. What I grapple with and what I've been trying to do, I've been doing this for over 20 years. I thought that by now people would understand the issues and they don't. I had a very good friend who has a garden, who's into healthy food, just emailed me and said, are, is organic food, can it be GMO? Can it be genetically engineered? I'm like, no, you know, blah, blah, blah. But, you know, she'd asked some questions. I'm like, oh, I have to Google that. I can't remember because things, you know, obviously laws and regulations change, but we have not done a good enough job educating or inspiring people enough to want to learn what they need to learn to do the right thing. And that I think is a huge hole in food and in changing food systems. And I think that, um, okay, I am going to get on a soapbox. I'm, so I mentioned earlier, I'm tired of the nonprofit industrial complex. I'm also tired of nonprofits who say, let's collaborate and collaborating only means promote my work, not collaborate. I think each person should do their own thing and come together and say, Hey, I'm doing this. Hey, I'm doing this. How can we work together? What, and that is collaboration. We don't have to do I do not believe in 100% consensus. I think that is a huge problem. It doesn't work, but you're an expert in trees. You do your tree thing. I'm an expert in tomatoes. I do my tomato thing. Let's come together and see how they work. Like what we can do to help and support each other. I don't think that happens. I fault foundations and I'm just talking nonprofit. I fault foundations and philanthropists for, even though they say they don't, making it competitive for their, for people not being allowed to earn a living wage for not getting funding. I think that if you want to create change, you have to start with the crazy people who have the vision, who are not going to be funded and who are not going to be able to have a for-profit. There needs to be a similarly minded, crazy, rich person to fund and invest. People need to be invested in. Maybe that's what I'm getting to. We need to invest in visionaries and change makers so that they can go out and inspire and do what needs to be done to create change. So for example, one of the things I think we need that I have never seen, I think we need a database of who's doing what. Like, do you know who David Hertz is? Because you should totally have I him do. on your show if I you do. don't. 
Yeah. Okay, so he founded the social gastronomy movement, but people in my world don't know who he is because he's outside the US. But he's doing, I just saw he's having a conference in October. And like some of the, I just right before we came on, I'm like signing up for panel after panel because I want to know what's going on. We, we can't do everything. We can find the people who are doing the things, connect that all together. I believe we need a roadmap to the world we want to live in or see, have our children live in. I do not believe that exists. I think the EAT report, the EAT Lancet report, I looked at it and the food they recommend for an entire day is my snack. Like it's just not gonna work in the West. But I think it was great what they did. I think they had a lot of, so that's a piece, you know? So anyway, how are we gonna build the roadmap, Mark? Well, I think I have a couple answers for you. So I believe that there is a roadmap. I believe we're on uh, the exponential roadmap to the future. The roadmap for me is really the sustainable development goals. I, I, I know you know I'm an advocate for the sustainable development goals and I can't think of, or I don't know of another global plan that gets us a little bit better to the future um, December 2030, then the Sustainable Development Goals, and like the EAT, EAT uh, uh, Foundation, EAT Form, all 17 of the Sustainable Development Goals are tied to food. 11 of them are intrinsically tied to food. There's targets and indicators, a lot of ways that they were developed, and I, I believe, I don't see them for countries and um, organizations or cities. I see them for us as individuals. I see that we apply them in a local, very small way because we all eat every day. Um, and then we can have this bigger ripple effect um, that, that goes much far, it's, it's, it's far reaching and it's actually very inclusive and it changes. It's not, uh, the SDGs are not an add on to business as usual. What they are is a brand new economy, global economy, brand new global operating system to get us to a sustainable infrastructure by December 2030, hopefully keep our, our planet below 1.5 degrees of warming and give us at least a solid enough foundation to springboard off into resilience. And I, I, I think that is a, a big roadmap. Most people don't even know, especially in the US, especially in indigenous uh, places. That's my question. Have yeah. no clue. What, what are the SDGs or how to apply them, uh, who they're for, how to understand them, what the monies are behind them, how they can even look and view at them. And I've done a lot of work behind that. We're, we're behind. I mean, it's 2020, we're, uh, five years after, and we're still talking and educating. Uh, I see us moving more in an exponential roadmap, and that's, that's also why it's ex it needs to be exponential, because if in the yeah. next five years we don't really take some hard actions and make some movement, then, then we're really gonna be way too late and far behind on it. So I agree, that is a vision. I don't know if I agree it's a roadmap. I do think it's a vision to work toward. The map are the routes that are gonna get us to that vision. Um, I, who is, working on making it happen, not just talking about it, because we can't, especially in the US, we can't stay in the education, what are the SDGs? Like when I, I spent a bit of time in Copenhagen oh, before the pandemic and there they get it, you know, they seem to get it. It's, 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 it's more in the DNA, whereas in the US, I, I mean, I hadn't really heard of them until I started going to eat and, you know, um, Though I do have to say, I was part of a group that was asked when they were just getting ready to launch them here. And I was like, yeah, huh. because they weren't marketed properly to the American mindset. But this is the challenge, I think. I don't think we have time to educate. So how do we incorporate what they are into what we're already doing? Um, and I... Uh, I don't have a place I can go to say, okay, who's working on SCG2? Because when, when, when I see no hunger, 
people think food pantry. No, that's a stopgap that doesn't end hunger, that helps people who are hungry, which is absolutely essential, absolutely essential. But how do we end hunger? And that gets into living wage, that gets into, you know, gets into, it's, they're all, and you know this because this is your expertise, they're all interconnected. They're all the a 17. system, they're all in, interconnected. Uh, we're so not, what's there, the there's map? no way we'll have time to address all these because I, I, now <laughs> you'll get me on my soapbox and I could talk days on SDGs, <laughs> roadmap plan and let's get it and you'll be so damn excited I, you probably won't go to sleep tonight you'll be out shouting sdgs uh from the streets but so we have to be careful i mean this this is a bit deep rabbit hole for me but because this is my passion but uh, but uh, it, it, it was almost unfair because i mean i believe that's our roadmap or plan and there are uh, not only targets and indicators monies and, and there's ways that we can get in there but I also am, am a big advocate for global food reform and how do we do that from the bottom up, a local level, and, and you know build these these resilient hubs around the world that are interconnected, that are really bringing us up to a different standard for our world. But also, the reason I say global food reform is as food has all, all, always been a global citizen, it probably always will be. And if we can see each other, you know, stop being divided by borders, nations, and these political boundaries, and get us onto a bit a global operating system where we're kind of all aligned, um, then it will work better because that's just how we function as well as as human beings and and uh, the complexities in science and and. I, 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 other than that, I mean, right now, I don't think it, it uh, because we're limited on time, unless we're going to break this into about five podcasts. Uh, <laughs> I, 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 I would like to get into that discussion with you. And also in the book, we'll break it down a lot more. Um, but there, it's a multifaceted, the way we solve global cha grand challenges is by taking a multifaceted systems view approach to tackling these solutions and in 2018 all international organizations the un world economic forum world trade organization on and on all switch to this systems you approach to life using systems dynamic modeling and solutions to solve our global grand challenges what what does that mean complex big exponential words and stuff is basically that this siloed or linear approach by just taking one facet of a complex problem and just addressing that has shown in the past that it's not solving our, our problems, that we need to address the multifaceted as a system. And then we're seeing much better results on solving these, these problems. The other thing that we're seeing is that it's also an exponential roadmap because what happens, not only the results at the end are much better, but that we reach this critical mass as humanity where we say, hey, this is a system that really works and is functioning well. And we've got community. We're not lonely. We don't feel like the only evangelist or the preacher or soapbox speaker, but we're a community. And then as we hit that critical mask, we actually see the results better. And the biggest proof is in the pudding. And I've, I've said this on other podcasts, so I'm not, not going to go into it too much here. But during this time of the pandemic and the lockdown, in the first, second, and third quarters, uh, 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 financial quarters uh, 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 of, of this year, we've seen that all sustainable index funds, sustainable investments, and ESG, or what they call environmental social governance uh, index and funds, divestments and investments, have all outperformed their conventional counterparts. Eight out of 10 outperformed their wow. conventional counterparts. And in the Morning Star Review, 25 out of 28 outperformed their conventional counting parts in the Morning Star Review. And I'm talking about the Nikkei, New York Stock Exchange, the NASDAQ, the S&P Global, the S&P 500. BlackRock came out, the CEO of BlackRock came out and listed all the CEOs in their portfolio. He said, if you don't make a divestment or investment in ESG, uh, change the business models, the annual reports, the, the divestments and investments towards ESG uh, sustainable index and funds and get that environmental social governance ingrained, you will be punished 
or you will be removed from the portfolio because that's the future. That's where we're going. And, and the reason why is because it's a better business model. It's a better operating system that shows that not only does it give you resilience, it gives you a return. And all, during this pandemic through all three quarters, okay, the first quarter, um, uh, it, 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 it was really good, but you could say, okay, this is just the farce. It's just the first quarter, but then it went second and third quarter. And what, what we're seeing is those essential services that you and I are talking about, food, personal protection equipment, digital services, skyrocketed. They took the, the hockey stick approach on, on their growth and their performance that was unbelievable and there's no sign of stopping. And it's showing that before when I, I've been talking about sustainability and these things for a while, when, when you talk about it, it's basically, um, oh, I'm not, sustainability is hard to do. It's hard to, to make right. this reform and do the right thing. It's costly. And maybe before 2015, maybe uh, before 2010 it was, but it's not anymore. And it's actually a better model. And to, to be sustainable, it means to sustain your company, your brand, your employees, yourself for future generations, to have enough resources to continue producing a product, to have a sustainable supply chain that in times like a pandemic, you can still have food and services and delivery and, and get those things because you've got those future of work in place and there. And so uh, that, that's my soapbox. I don't want to get onto it, but there's some real proof that it's better business model. In, in our industry, the Rodale Institute and many others uh, just came out with Kiss the Ground and some other be yeah. beautiful things. They're showing that these regenerative, these permacultures, uh, the agroforestry and uh, no-till are a better business model and much better for human health and our environment. And uh, we make those switches in, in all these areas. Boy, the future is bright. And and we hit that critical mass, there's no going back. I don't know I if agree. you have anything to say, I can't. To say about that, but that well, was my you know, when So I consider myself, you know, smart enough, not super intelligent smart enough, but there was one thing I never got was finance. But one thing I did when I, years ago, was working in companies and starting my retirement accounts, I'm like, I want sustainable funds. I want sustainable, like I just, this is before I even really was working in this world. Um, and that's, that was just deep rooted within me. Like I didn't want to give to nuclear arms dealers. But I think what people need to realize is that when you talk about these funds having great returns, that's because people are buying the products, which is making the company do better on the stock market, which is making investing being better. And it's, it's all interconnected. So it, you, can, you can wind it all the way back to each of us sitting in our chair, making the decision to invest or to buy that healthier thing. Um, with regard to regenerative, I think Rodale is amazing. Like I love them. I heard, I can't, I think it's Pelican. There's a, an investment fund in the UK and it's a lot of money that's going into regenerative. I don't know of the same here. Um, there was a film out this past year called Biggest, or it was last year, Biggest Little Farm. It's on Netflix yep. now. It's amazing. It's a piece of art. The one thing, unfortunately, they don't address is how much money it costs to transition to regenerative. That's the big stumbling block. So how do we encourage investors to put their money into regenerative? This can come down to triple bottom line. Maybe you're not gonna get, I don't know, a 50% return. Maybe you'll get a 30% return. Well, you'll have better karma, you'll sleep better and your next life will be much happier. I mean, you know, how do you convince people that um, this is, if you, again, I'm gonna go back to, if you want your children or your grandchildren to have a planet. People have to start taking this seriously. I, I, I wish more people with vision and passion were the people with all that money. Yeah, I do too. There, yeah. there, there, there's a lot of people out there with money, but no ideas, no vision or passion. And, uh, and that's a, a big shift we, we definitely need to make and um, that they they put that into uh, long-term, really sustainable um, 
projects and 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 companies that uh, can really help us for the long term. Um, I, I, I've seen that time and time again. Such beautiful, wonderful projects, ideas, people who really know if they had the money, they'd know what to do with right. it, and it would be a fabulous investment, and it would be good for uh, triple uh, the triple bottom line: people, planet, and profit. It would be it would really be. Um, go to good but uh it just is still very slow moving it has picked up so we we i i like i said at the beginning of this year this year started out with a bang it was very fabulous i was on my tour to davos the road to davos uh um, dld and boma we did an event and and um the world economic forum and there was a lot of sustainable and noble ambitions set at the beginning of this year. And they've actually uh, have not stopped momentum. It's gotten even more and people have doubled down, tripled down, and, it, and we're still moving in a positive way. Uh, it's, and it's gonna continue. So I, I'm very hopeful and optimistic that we're gonna go in that way. I have, um, we, we've got to wrap it up soon, but I have three, questions for you, last questions for you, and they're really for my listeners. So I want to give my listeners a sustainable takeaway from you that uh, maybe can help them or give you, you can depart some of your wisdom to them. Um, if there is one message you could depart to our listeners, a sustainable takeaway that has the power to change their life, what would it be? It's basically your message. You matter. No matter who you are, where you are, what you've done, you matter. Every decision you make, every breath you take, everything you do, you matter. So if you want to be part of creating the world we want to see, just think about what you're doing and and understand that that decision to buy the you know seventh generation unbleached toilet paper matters and i think we need we you and i mark yeah. and people like us need to work harder to get consumers to understand and everyone is a consumer to understand that everything you do is important everything and that i think is something we need to work harder at letting people understand and and not just that people matter through that you are connected to everything um and i, I think i'm just gonna leave it there like we i, I, all... I really love it it, it is true <laughs> uh, and you know Yeah, I'm not. I'm not going to add anything to that. I, I I think you. I think you summarized it beautifully, and it's true. Everybody does matter. Um, I, I I like to say that we're all crew members on Spaceship Earth. That we can really put our hand on the steering wheel and not just steer where our future goes of the Earth, but that we matter. That we can do something. And, you know, uh, try. And you've heard this before. It's, Try sleeping in a room with a small mosquito. I guarantee you that small right. little thing matters, you know, and uh, it's the same with us. Even though we may feel small or we feel this existential greatness of what we're facing, we matter. We can make an impact we, and, and we're important. And, and you're important to not only you and me, but to, to everyone else. Uh, so the next question is, um, what should young innovators in your field, food, sharing, be thinking about or if they're looking for ways to make real impact? Wow. I would say, not that you think about it, but don't always listen to the old people like Mark and myself because we have our ideas, but your ideas are what we really need. Um, I'm not minimizing us. I think we are extremely relevant, but 
I remember when I started, you know, when I was younger and I get a lot of, uh, yeah, no, we don't do it that way. I don't care if we don't do it that way. Just do it your way because that's how we change the world. Perfect. I'm not going to say anything about that. And the last. <laughs> I feel like this is a test. <laughs> You're passing with flying colors. <laughs> Correct answer. You, how in the <laughs> hell did? I, how did you get my answers to this test? Uh, oh, my goodness. The last one is um, what two or three actions can citizens uh, and decision makers take to help accelerate the impact in your field or global food reform or eat. food and share. I was going to say, so, okay, I'm going to draw this back to change food and the work I'm doing. Um, you know, look around you. What can you do? Can you start a community fridge? Can you compost? Can you volunteer at your farmer's market? Like this is on a consumer local basis. Um, you know, volunteer. If you would, if what I've seen over the years, what's crazy is when I started in the food movement, like there wasn't even a degree in sustainability or sustainable food systems. There's degrees all over now. So I get a lot of students who want informational interviews or who want to intern or they want to know what to do for their future. It's, it's still not easy um, to get a, let's say living wage job. That's why I'm a proponent of start your own business. And then you can be a consultant to a nonprofit, consultant to for-profit. I think we didn't touch on this, the nonprofit for-profit hybrid model should be looked at more seriously. I hope if you haven't had a guest yet, you can have an expert on that on. I will be the first person watching because I have both a for-profit and a nonprofit and I still don't understand what I'm doing. Um, don't give up. There is this TED talk and it's, I think it's my favorite TED talk. It's by Derek Sivers. It's three minutes long. It's how to create a movement. And what basically is, and you need to watch it. It's, it's the video is not great quality, but it, it's the video is what really uh, makes you understand. That person with the vision is the crazy person. And everyone's going to look at you as the crazy person. And they're going to laugh at you. And they're going to go, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Then you're going to get that first follower. And that first follower is going to join you. And then all of a sudden, it's like other people are like, whoa, whoa, whoa. And then you get that second follower. And then you have a movement. And then people will join it. And that's human nature. So if you have a vision of change that you truly believe in, don't give up. Don't give up. Don't give up. Don't give up. Look for the one or two people. That's all you need to create a global movement. Diane, you are so wonderful. And I'm so thankful for you. It's been a sheer pleasure. We need to do this more often. Probably we, we need to do like yes. every six months, have a call and, and, and record it uh, because we could talk for hours. I just know it. Um, there's so much. We're, we're, we're such, and when, uh, at least I'm in such an old fart. I, I don't know. I, I, we've been around and uh, there's so many things that I, that I think about that um, I would just love to unpack and sp speak to you about. And, and uh, I, I think it would be nice for those to, to listen and hear us. If there's anything you want to add or we forgot or questions that you want to ask me before I say goodbye, please do it now. This is your chance. Wow, the most pressure. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, really, I just want to tell everyone, be safe, take care. Uh, the pandemic is life changing. We're all going through it. Even though we're going through it together, I know it feels like we are alone. Um, I am taking this as an opportunity to make some really uh, big change in my life in a very positive way that I probably wouldn't have made otherwise. So like go with your passion and just gratitude lists. I think what changed my life, if you want something to do and you're getting a little like overwhelmed, start writing a gratitude list, five things every day that you're grateful for. You can be grateful for the fact you have toenails. You can be grateful for the fact you have heat. You can be grateful that we have a planet. Like it could be from the smallest to the largest, just there's so much to be grateful for. There's so much beauty in the world um, that I, I am honored that I got to share these few minutes and my ideas with you because this, this was my um, gift today to be able to be part of this conversation, Mark. So thank you.
it is a gift and I thank you and I'm very, I, I will cherish it and we will, I'll post all your links and some show notes and if we talked about certain things, I'll post those in, in the description as well. And I look forward to seeing and speaking to you very soon. Thanks Scotland, so much. Scotland, when we can travel again. We both yeah. agreed we love Scotland. Scotland. Yeah. yeah, let's meet in Scotland. I'm, I'm going to come visit you. Do. Yep. Yep. All right, Diane. Take care. Have a good one. Bye-bye. Bye, Mark. Thank Thanks. you. Thanks.